everyone, welcome to the series 2022 company briefing on the Virginia climate and clean energy policy landscape. My name is Mel Mackin and I'm manager of state policy at Ceres, leading our efforts in the southeast. A lot is happening in Virginia right now and we may be headed into an all deck, all hands on deck a legislative session. So we really appreciate you all carving out the time to be here today. On today's agenda, we have an overview of Virginia's political landscape and expectations for 2022, as well as clean energy policy opportunities under new state leadership. We'll close with the review of a current series sign letter opportunity and time for questions. While we will have dedicated time for Q&A at the end uh, of the presentation, you're welcome to ask questions at any time by using the raise hand function or via the chat. You can send questions directly to me or to everyone through the chat. Now, before we jump in, I'll start with a quick introduction of series for those of you who may be new to us, though I think I see pretty much all familiar folks on the call. Ceres is a national sustainability organization working with the most influential investors and companies to build leadership and drive climate related solutions to sustainability issues throughout the economy. Many of you on the call today are members of the Ceres Bicep Network, our advocacy network of businesses committed to working with policymakers to pass meaningful energy and climate legislation. Ceres also coordinates the Corporate EV Alliance, a group of major U.S and global companies working together to accelerate the transition to electric vehicles. And we also coordinate the series energy optimization work group, another group of collaborative companies, uh, energy efficiency, energy optimization service companies uh, working together to advocate for policies to move the energy system forward uh, to clean and efficient technologies. In addition to series, today you'll be hearing from Matt Manzel and Jenny O'Halloran from Broad Street Group, a Richmond-based lobbying group and consultants to series, and the Virginia chapter of Conservatives for Clean Energy. I'll let Ron and Andrew introduce themselves and the organization before we turn back to Matt and Jenny. Hey, this is, okay, hey, Andrew. It's uh, Ron Butler. I'm the executive director of Conservatives for Clean Energy, started in May. Um, we're an organization that supports an all of the, the above approach to energy. Uh, we've been involved uh, in the Virginia uh, political and, and legislative arena since 2017 when, when Andrew started. Um, we have um, a legislative reception that we do every year that brings policymakers, legislators uh, together. Uh, we recognize Republican legislators uh, at at conservative legislators, I should say, at this reception. Uh, we have an event coming up on the 19th, and uh, we have a couple legislators we're uh, recognizing there. We also have the Attorney General uh, elect Jason Miares, who's going to be attending. Winsome Sears is also going to be attending the event um, on the 19th. Um, it's sponsored by um, a dozen uh, companies that are in, in the solar industry. Um, Amazon Web Services is, sp is sponsoring the event. It's an in-person event uh, in Richmond at the Omni. Um, and Andrew, go ahead and you can introduce yourself because you have a, a long history in policy in Virginia. Sure, thanks Ron and thanks Mel and Sirius for, for hosting today. Happy to be a participant. Um, yeah, Conservatives for Clean Energy has been around since uh, late 2016. Um, but as Ron said, we're here to, to really educate and engage with policymakers um, at the state level also more recently. Uh, at the local level as well on siting issues and things like that. Um, personally, uh, worked in Virginia state government politics for at least 15 years and uh, served as energy advisor to Governor Bob McDonald during the uh, previous Republican administration. And so I was excited to uh, get involved with this organization a few years ago. Um, in addition to Virginia, you all may be familiar with our work in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. So. Um, across the Southeast and engaging as, as again with conservative uh, lawmakers and, and, and others on the benefits of clean energy and, and trying to approach it in, in a way that um, folks on, on the center right can really get behind and uh, help advocate uh, to a cleaner energy uh, transition. Uh, so thanks again for having us and look forward to the discussion. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Ron Andrew. Uh, Sirius has a, a history of working with the conservatives for clean energy chapters in many states, including Virginia, and uh, we are pleased to continue that partnership into the new year. Uh, now, Jenny and Matt, can you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about what happened during this year's November elections? What can we expect from the upcoming legislative session and the rest of 22, and how important the role of the business community will be? Sure thing. Thanks, Mel, and uh, thank you all for for letting us join you this uh, uh, afternoon. Um, I'm going to kick off and, and cover sort of the campaign political context uh, uh, from especially 2021 and going into this 2022 session, and then I'll uh, turn it over to Jenny to, to cover more of the, the sort of policy uh, landscape side of things. Um, as many, if, if not all of you all know, uh, going into the 2021 um, gubernatorial election in Virginia. Um, Virginia was kind of viewed by maybe more national pundits as a quote unquote blue state. Uh, in both 2017 and 2020, uh, the top of the ticket um, voted Democratic by about 55% uh, of the vote, both for Governor Northam uh, in 2017 and then for now President Biden in 2020. Um, uh, it was not that long ago, and, and many on this Zoom also remember that just in 2009, uh, Governor McDonnell, uh, Andrew's former boss, was elected statewide with almost 60% of the vote. So I think maybe the, uh, uh, the pundit's view of where Virginia stood in the red-blue spectrum was a little overstated. But either way, going into the 2021 gubernatorial election, uh, uh, Governor-elect Yunkin was was nominated in May, I believe, in a um, convention, and uh, former Governor McAuliffe was nominated in June in a primary, uh, both um, fairly comfortably nominated and going into the fall elections with kind of an expectation of a, a Democratic tilt in Virginia. Um, the sort of national environment and as things sort of unfolded nationally, both with COVID response and other non-Virginia affiliated issues created a dynamic in the gubernatorial race uh, that, that certainly tightened the, uh, the polling numbers. And um, McAuliffe, who sort of had uh, highlighted his connections on the federal level, uh, run somewhat as an incumbent, uh, given that he was uh, governor from 2014 to 2018. Uh, and he became sort of the candidate of, of the sort of establishment. Um, governor Yunkin, who, who, uh, or Governor-elect Yunkin, who, who had a background in private equity, had not uh, um, participated in, in Virginia government in, in a high profile way, uh, sort of ran as the outsider and, and kind of seized on some of the frustrations that, that many Virginians felt around um, COVID mandates uh, he focused on sort of the historic um, uh, budget surplus that existed in Virginia and, and uh, really messaged uh, hard and directly on, on returning that money to Virginia taxpayers. Um, the uh, school situation and, and sort of the dynamics around school openings, mandates uh, around vaccines and masking and sort of other kind of educational curricula related um, issues were, were also a big piece of uh, Governor-elect Youngkin's message, and uh, he certainly seized on, on what appeared to be a, a strong um, backlash in uh, larger school systems around what the proper role of, of parents were, and that seemed to be really the highest profile message that, that Governor-elect Youngkin pushed going down the stretch. So, uh, you know, I think at the beginning of 2021, folks um, were questioning if a Republican could be elected statewide. I think uh, Governor-elect Youngkin uh, proved that a formula that included uh, substantial margins in, in rural Virginia, uh, those that, the margins that actually exceeded uh, how former President Trump did in rural areas, as well as uh, cutting down on the uh, margins for the Democratic candidate in, in larger suburbs like Henrico County, Loudoun County, Prince William County, uh, allowed for, for Governor-elect Youngkin to, to receive just under 51% of the vote. So, um, you know, a, his messaging, Governor-elect Youngkin's messaging, um, and sort of the high-profile nature of the Virginia uh, gov gubernatorial election in the national picture uh, are sort of 
hanging over or uh, uh, the, the main sort of banner going into the 2022 session from the statewide election. Uh, uh, I would also note that uh, in addition to Governor-elect Youngkin, uh, Winsome Sears was elected Lieutenant Governor, uh, Jason Miaris elected Attorney General, both also Republicans, and um, uh, with about the same margin, about 51% of the vote, 50 and a half to 51% of the vote. So uh, that is a change. Obviously, the last two uh, gubernatorial terms were Democratic governors and Democratic statewide elected officials. So um, Richmond is, is once again under unified statewide Republican control. Additionally, the uh, all 100 seats of the Virginia House of Delegates were up this year. Um, Democrats held a 55 to 45 seat advantage um, after taking control of the House of Delegates uh, in the 2019 uh, midterm elections. Um, there were a number of sort of targeted areas um, where Republicans picked up those necessary set, um, how many? Uh, those seven seats that they needed to, to have their 52 to 48 majority it included rural areas in, in southwestern Virginia and southside Virginia, also the suburbs, especially in Hampton Roads, a couple of seats in Virginia Beach uh, and up in, in the Hampton area flipped as well. Uh, so um, again, fairly narrow margins. There are a couple of seats that were, were uh, in recount that, that Republicans held. So uh, Republicans now come in with a 52 to 48 majority, similar to their 51 to 49 majority uh, that they held in the 2018 and 2019 sessions. Um, one other item I'd, I'd like to mention that kind of is, is hanging over all of the legislative conversations, at least uh, for this um, uh, 2022 session is redistricting. And Virginia adopted a new approach to redistricting, a um, nonpartisan, bipartisan approach to redistricting, uh, that those maps were finalized last month. And um, actually, legislators are still sort of thinking through their approach. But um, it's important for all of us to keep in mind that the legislators, um, these are the last two sessions that these legislators will be representing the districts in which they serve currently. Um, the uh, courts redrew maps in a way that was uh, blind to incumbent um, addresses, and that has created a number of scenarios in the Senate. There are two districts that have three different Senate incumbents representing them, and then another seven districts that have uh, two incumbents in them. Uh, on the House side, there are uh, also two districts with three incumbents uh, representing them currently, and 19 districts with two incumbents. Uh, the, the gist of that, or the, the bottom line from that, is that there are currently members of the legislature who are weighing their next step. Do they want to move? Do they want to be in a primary with a colleague? Uh, you know, are they in a more liberal, more conservative district? And that will certainly affect how um, they serve their either current or future constituents or how they determine their political future. Um, and that's going to be something we have heard um, recently since those maps were released about how legislators may alter their approach to certain issues. And I think we will continue to hear that as, as uh, this session progresses. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Jenny uh, and she can cover some more of the policy landscape. Great, thanks, Matt. So there are um, a number of dynamics heading into session that I think are worth um, thinking through as we think about policy priorities. Um, redistricting is obviously um, one of the big ones. Um, another one is of course that while there have been shifts in the House and the executive branch, the Senate remains status quo. Um, so they still have a slim Democratic majority in the Senate, 21 to 19. However, um, with the new Republican Lieutenant Governor who can break a tie vote on most issues, um, you know, it just takes one Democrat to defect or somebody not present that day um, to uh, really change um, change the dynamics for a piece of legislation. Um, Senate Democrats will likely use committees where the, the margins are larger for Democrats um, to deal with bills that they don't want to see on the floor, that they don't want to see move forward, um, but it is something to watch closely. Um, Given the slim majority um, that Republicans have in the House and the fact that they'll be on the ballot um, again, potentially in the fall, this fall of 2022, pending a, a court case, but definitely in the fall of 2023, um, there will be some pressure on them to make progress on, 
on um, a number of issues. Um, the past couple of years, the past two years with Democrats in control of the executive branch, as well as both chambers, um, has seen a lot of movement on a range of progressive issues, um, a wide range of issues. Um, and it's expected that you know the incoming House majority will want to um, have their say on on a lot of those issues. Um, as far as climate policy goes, um, Speaker Designee Gilbert and others have made comments, in particular as it relates to sort of the cost of cost to consumers of new the new policies that were put in place, like the Virginia Clean Economy Act, and that is a sentiment that is shared. Um, not just by Republicans, but there are um, Democratic members as well in the House who who share those concerns um, and would like to see more oversight. At the, <clears throat> excuse me, by the State Corporation Commission on some of these matters. So um, there could be bipartisan support in the House, in particular, um, for uh, amendments to the Clean Economy Act, in particular. Um, in the Senate, while there is a pro-climate policy majority. Um, there are also a number of Democratic members and a, um, powerful Democratic members who are um, close with Dominion um, and that, you know, Dominion supported, of course, the Clean Economy Act at the end of the day. Um, but if their posture changes, if there are amendments being entertained, um, that could um, be um, something else to watch in the Senate. Um, it is not likely that the VCEA will be overturned in its entirety. I think that the Senate is um, pretty clear about that, and I don't think I've heard the you know new House majority saying that that is their intention. Um, but it is very possible that changes um, could be made. Um, Andrew and Ron are going to talk a little bit more about Yunkin's um, uh, priorities, but I do want to emphasize the other sort of elephant in the room, which is the new um, appointment. Uh, for Secretary of National Resources or his intended appointment of Andrew Wheeler. And I mention it because, um, you know, it's both an issue that advocates care about, but it's also going, and, and Democratic senators, um, but it's going to impact the political dynamics of the session as it relates to climate issues. So already, you know, some Senate Democrats are gearing up for a potential battle on the, the nomination. Um, you know, a lot of news about that. We'll continue to watch it. Um, but as with other things in session, that could have ripple effects as to how other matters in this policy space are handled. Um, so um, the last thing I want to mention, um, and probably more importantly, is that um, we are working with a coalition of advocates and the focus for this session is defending three primary, uh, primary pieces of legislation, um, the Clean Economy Act, REGI, and the Clean Cars legislation that passed last year that um, I know many of you engaged on. Um, so those, you know, not all of the bills have dropped. We don't know yet what the landscape it is going to look like, um, but there already are some bills that amend um, or address the VCEA. We expect to see more. Um, we expect to see legislation as it relates to Reggie. Um, and um, the Senate is going to be key to making sure that these pieces of legislation are protected um, and will need to be in regular communication with those members. Um, and I guess just to emphasize, we can't take their support for granted. We're gonna have to, like I said, continue to communicate with them and make sure they know where we stand um, and, and how, how we would like them to vote. Um, so on that note, I'll turn it back to Matt to talk a little bit about the importance of, um, of your voice in this conversation. Yeah, and I'll, I'll uh, just cover this really quickly because I know a lot of you all are, are seasoned advocates for for your companies. But um, you know, the the last two years, especially um, with unified Democratic control and the adoption of the Clean Economy Act and and Reggie and and clean cars, um, the sort of accepted dynamic has been between sort of more progressive. Um, clean energy environmental policy voices versus the corporate community. And that's obviously, as you all know, an oversimplification of, of how these issues break down. So I think um, you all, and to the extent you all want to engage and do engage on these issues, I think you bring a fresh voice and a, a unique approach that I think is important for legislators of any partisan stripe to hear. Um, you know, a, a large, uh, successful um, business who, who is unilaterally or, or voluntarily adopting certain um, uh, clean energy goals internally is something that I think it's important for 
Democrats and Republicans to hear. And so I think as you all sort of watch the session unfold, as you all consider if and how you want to engage, uh, that's something that uh, with a Yunkin administration and a new House majority who are, are uh, I would say, um, objectively more, more business friendly, more open to hearing um, business concerns about policies, uh, those folks will want to hear and want to know if there is another side to this story. So you all are, are very integral to that, to that conversation. Um, and then, as, as Jenny has already mentioned, the Senate, um, though controlled narrowly by the um, Democratic Party, uh, has always taken a, a slightly more business-friendly tone as well. So as um, series and as you all individually take a uh, role in the policy debate, uh, helping those Democratic senators understand that they can can protect some of these policy wins from from past years while also being uh, business friendly. I think those are important messages for you all to carry as well. So um, that's all I wanted to cover, and, and I'll I'll throw it back to Mel now to to cover the next topic. Thanks so much, Matt and Jenny. Uh, one question here, given that the legislative session is only sixty days, and a lot of legislators are in new leadership roles. Can we expect there to be a lot of potential changes um, in in this first session under Yunkin? Um, I know there are a, a few bills already that have been introduced that do propose amendments to the VCA and Reggie, but realistically, given the time frame, um, how much can we expect of this conversation? I'll, I guess I'll start on that, and, and I'm sure Jenny and Andrew and Ron all have have thoughts as well. But I think. You know, with divided government, I think expectations for major changes um, are limited. Um, I think you do have 21 Democratic senators who have already voted for these bills. And so having them change their view, change their vote, change their opinion on these policies is going to be a challenge. Uh, however, um, there are other issues unrelated to, to those which we've discussed already. Um, the budget, um, you know, nominees to, to the courts, things that are completely unrelated, however, do end up getting tied into uh, sort of omnibus negotiations around various priorities. So I would say the general consensus is not a lot will, will change under divided government in this way. However, I think there are avenues for the new governor, avenues for the new House majority uh, to push to to gain that upper hand and they do um, as a party uh, control those two out of three entities and and they'll look to push that advantage to to make some changes so that's a long way of saying minor changes are likely um, could be major depending on how much the senate uh, seeks to to cut deals and, and move away from their initial position matt i would just add and i know the point was made that obviously with a new majority, there's new leadership in, in key committees and, and other leadership roles. Um, it's important to remember that, uh, you know, at least for some of the more senior members of the House, most of them have been around a long time and, you know, they were in the majority up until a couple of years ago. And so, you know, they, they are pretty well versed in a lot of these issues, um, had worked on them over the course of a number of years. And, you know, for instance, in the uh, Commerce and Labor Committee over in the House, um, you know, we'll have a new chair in uh, Kathy Byron, um, but Terry Kilgore, who was the previous chair, is now serving as a majority leader. And so, um, you know, everyone who's been really uh, keyed in to these issues for quite a while, you know, is, is still there. And um, so I think the learning curve isn't quite as steep as maybe it normally would be with the change in uh, leadership. But obviously with a new incoming governor, that's different. And, and to Matt's point, threading the needle um, on what could be you know, acceptable to, uh, you know, the, of any controversy in both the House uh, Republican caucus and, and Senate Democrats um, is going to be pretty narrow in terms of what, what would be achievable in anything that's going to be controversial, I think is, um, yeah, certainly uh, less likely than, than it has been for the last couple of years to move through. So, um, and, and in the House too, Andrew, um, Terry Kilgore supported the Clean Economy Act. Um, he was he was a Republican vote for that, and he's the majority leader now. And and there was a Republican vote in the Senate, Jill Bogo also, um, that supported it. 
Great, thanks all. And now um, I do wanna do a quick reminder to everyone on the call that you can send questions at any point over the chat to me or visible to everyone. Um, and there will also be more opportunities to ask questions during the Q&A portion at the end. Um, so thanks again, Matt and Jenny and Ron and Andrew. Um, can you now tell us a little bit more about Yunkin's position on clean energy, what his energy policy priorities are or expected to be, um, tying in some of the recent remarks we've heard about the regional uh, greenhouse gas initiative. And also, um, you know, again, it would be great to hear where in particular you think the business voice can have the most impact. Sure. Well, I'm happy to, to take a stab at this first. Um, actually, before I talk about Yunkin, I wanted to touch just a little bit, and I know we did, so I won't be long-winded at all, but on the New majority in the in the House of Delegates, um, you know, they're a fairly conservative bunch on the whole. Um, Speaker designee uh, Gilbert um, would be considered, you know, pretty conservative leader as well. Soon after the election, um, of course, had a press conference highlighting some of the things that they anticipated seeing in their 2022 agenda, and really taking a look at some of what he would consider some of the progressive energy policies from the past couple of years was one of the items that he mentioned. I think um, certainly I would say though, not the top of the agenda, I think more issues like education um, reform, some of the business um, issues, uh, even some of the COVID restrictions, I think were much more kind of top priority um, for folks during the campaign season. You know, Ron and I and, and others who, you know, work, fairly closely with a lot of the uh, different candidates for office. I don't recall, and, and I'm sure I, there was something that I didn't see. You didn't really see campaigns talking about the Clean Economy Act. I don't think I remember anyone running in their campaign uh, against the BCEA. Um, occasionally, some candidates would talk about, um, you know, working to roll back legislation that would raise your electric bills by $800. And of course, that's a reference to the State Corporation Commission analysis, I believe. Um, I just thought it was kind of interesting to note that as far as I could tell and others, there, re there really wasn't um, any sort of an anti-clean energy campaign out there on the whole, um, which obviously I think is, is important going into the session. Um, and then as well, just as I've mentioned before, you know, Majority Leader, uh, incoming Majority Leader, Terry Kilgore, um, previously serving as the chairman of the committee uh, for a number of years, has, has generally been a little more forward thinking on some of these clean energy policies than most of his colleagues and his caucus, at least. Um, I think that is, you know, somewhat true of the Southwest gen delegation in general, um, he being from Southwest Virginia, um, historically known as coal country, I think, with the um, you know, the way that the economy down there has taken a hit, especially as the coal uh, mining has sort of faded over year, over the years. Um, most of them have just been, you know, really interested in doing anything that they could to support in all of the above. If it's, uh, you know, wind or solar or storage or whatever it might be, they're all for it because um, any jobs and investment that they can get to come to the region um, is a good thing. Of course, they've got a big a uh, pump storage type project that they've been pushing for quite a while. So, you know, I think having Delegate Kilgore in, in that majority leader role will help. And certainly we've had some positive conversations with them uh, since the election on, on these issues um, at a high level. As far as um, Governor-elect goes, um, certainly consistent with other campaigns, energy wasn't something that he really focused on. I think at least a couple of times he had responded to questions in the debate about where he stood. Uh, my recollection is when asked, would he have signed the Clean Economy Act? I believe he said he would not, um, given that he didn't you know, necessarily agree with everything in the bill. Um, that's consistent with where most of his um, fellow Republicans are. You know, Obviously, as Ron mentioned, you had Delegate Kilgore and Senator Vogel voting for it, but you know, overwhelmingly, his peers had had uh, not been in support of the bill as it was drafted, but that's not to say um, that a top priority of his administration would be to come in and to and to roll that back and to repeal the VCEA. Um, you know, 
given that he hadn't really talked a whole lot um, during the campaign in any great detail, of course, that was fairly consistent in a lot of policy areas, but certainly in energy, we didn't see a lot of uh, policy detail from the campaign. I wanted to point out just a couple of um, quotes that we had highlighted um, over the last several months uh, from Governor Elect Youngkin that we felt like would, you know, hopefully shed some light on kind of where he views these issues generally. Um, these were um, in an interview he had done with, with Bloomberg um, talking about um, renewable uh, energy in general and then um, ESG type uh, governance policies. Uh, the first thing he said was um, what, uh, what has happened over the last few years is the economic reality of renewables has settled in. What I mean by that is that they have come way down the cost curve and so they're literally uh, on a power production pay, uh, basis wildly competitive with, comp with other fuel sources. And so it's enabling wind and solar to compete on its own. Um, that coupled with political momentum for renewables in our mind makes renewables a very good place to invest. You know, I think that's just from a business uh, person's perspective as, um, as the CEO at the Carlisle Group, you know, him just having, and, and if you actually go back and listen to some of the interviews he did, he has a very actually strong understanding of energy, global energy markets. And I think it's a good sign um, that, you know, he is recognizing not only the economic realities of cost competitiveness in this space, but also the political realities and recognizing that businesses and consumers alike uh, want to see more expanded access to clean and renewable energy. So I think that's a good thing. And the second thing I wanted to point out um, was he was talking about ESG uh, policies, but he said Carlisle, um, which he was CEO, Carlisle actually went carbon neutral as a company last year. We did that because we think it's the right thing to do, but we also did that to show that we believe taking ESG principles into primary investment mode isn't just a good thing to do, but you can in fact economically have better outcomes because consumers want to buy products from companies that in fact take these things not only into consideration, but make them a priority. Uh, that increases value and is good for the investor. So I think, you know, on the one hand, you have a, a seasoned business person who has a very strong understanding of um, clean and renewable energy and, and cost competitiveness, um, demand from consumers. Um, and, and then on the other hand, you have, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. But I think folks who like to see those comments from the incoming governor um, also um, are taken aback a little bit with, with the appointment of someone like um, Andrew Wheeler. Um, I, personally, I haven't um, really dug into understanding a lot of the background, but I know a lot of folks do have some concerns um, about, uh, you know, his appointment and what, um, you know, his role at, at the EPA as administrator during the Trump administration. You know, as, as Jenny pointed out, Democratic um, leadership is still in the majority uh, over in the Senate, and it takes a majority to confirm these appointments. And so um, time will tell whether that there are any issues there with, with him being confirmed by the Senate. Certainly, we've seen a number of statements from individual senators across the state. Um, you know, I, as you mentioned um, as well, Mel, the uh, Reggie. Uh, withdrawal was was something that a lot of folks had some concerns about. I think you know from a fundamental uh, at a fundamental level, you know it all is for for the governor elect tying back to cost of living, and that was just his overall um, consistent theme within his message during the campaign. And whether you're talking about food tax and groceries or the gas tax or um, or other things, including um, you know energy and electricity cost of living was really at the core of a lot of the things that he talked about in this campaign. And so, you know, it's one of those things where depending on which attorney you ask, uh, some folks think that the governor has the authority to withdraw and others think that he does not have the authority to withdraw. I guess, um, you know, some attorneys will, will do well trying to sort that one out and eventually we'll have an answer. Um, but from the governor's perspective, if he believes that he has the authority to withdraw, you know, it was a quick and easy uh, low-hanging fruit type um, thing that he could do to immediately put $50, $60 a year back into the pocket of a typical household. And so 
um, you know, I think whatever, you know, whatever policy issues that we all collectively work on in the upcoming session, it'll be important to look at those through a cost of living uh, lens and, and, and recognizing that not only the governor elect, but I think that the House of Delegates in particular will have a, a keen um, eye on on those types of impacts and, and how it affects the policies um, that they are taking up. Uh, the, the only other thing I would touch on is, uh, you know, the Yunkin administration has, you know, expressed some skepticism about monopoly, monopoly utilities. And so depending on you, who you ask, some observers kind of see a, a possible opportunity um, to take another look at that, whether it is, as Jenny said, um, some bipartisan consensus around giving the State Corporation Commission more oversight and scrutiny around um, how the utilities go about a lot of these programs. Um, perhaps in some ways that might mean more competition and power generation or um, you know, supporting other policies that empower businesses and individuals to whether it's um, have more choice about procuring or generating their own electricity. So I think, um, you know, that is sort of the one additional, you know, thing from a high level perspective about uh, the Yunkin administration that, that I think there is a, at least some skepticism there in it or open mindedness about rethinking how the state, um, you know, looks at some of those policies. Although, um, go back again to what Jenny said, I mean, the Senate is unchanged and certainly the, the Senate um, doesn't necessarily sh share that view. So, of course, uh, important to keep that in mind. So, um, Ron, I don't know if you have anything you want to add, but... Um, I, I would just point out that even uh, when he announced the uh, withdrawing from Reggie, that he did, he did say that he supported offshore um, the offshore energy project and support solar. And so every, every chance he gets, he does mention kind of an, an all of the above approach to it. It's not as, uh, it's not as one sided as say, uh, would come out of uh, uh, President Trump's mouth. It's much, much more balanced. And I think reflective of, of when he was CEO at Carlisle, his statements. And, and we, we try to remind them of that every time we can. And I do think it's really important for, for the members of Syria and the business community to, to remind him of that too. And especially with our house members, um, uh, they need to know, okay, that the, the, the business community in Virginia wants these, these kind of energy solutions and they don't want to withdraw uh, uh, from the Virginia Clean Economy Act that they support these things. Um, so in, any, I, I think as prominent as you guys can be in terms of we're reinforcing that this session will be critically important and we, and we can help with that too. We'd love to amplify the voices of, of the business community because it's, it's what our folks on the conservative side listen to. Thank you. Uh, we had one question coming over the chat um, about how Reggie proceeds are spent, um, which from my understanding this past year, 95% um, of the Proceeds from Reggie auctions were split between um, community flood preparedness and energy efficiency for uh, low income customers. So while Reggie does impose costs on typical households um, through the ratepayer bills, it does also give uh, money back to perhaps the most vulnerable communities and individuals. Any other comments there? No, that's right. And then, um, I, you know, I think it's worth at least noting um, Delegate Will Moorefield from Southwest Virginia did put in legislation related to Reggie, not to repeal um, or withdraw Virginia from Reggie, but to modify how some of those dollars were spent, some of the historic flooding in Southwest. Um, you know, there's a lot of devastation from that. And, you know, at least from his perspective as a member of the Republican House Caucus, he felt that, um, you know, a good option would be to, to capitalize on those available dollars and, and use them to help address some of those challenges. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. But yeah, I think that's my understanding, Mel, in terms of how that split works. You also had a yeah, question. And I'll, can, if I could just add, sorry, Absolutely. Mel, that the, um, the funds are available for statewide use. Um, so that is something that is of interest to, you know, legislators across the state, not just in the Hampton Roads region where 
um, coastal resilience issues are at the forefront. We also had a question come in um, about if we expect litigation on ready withdrawal, if it's attempted to be done by executive order, which I might be hard to know at this point, um, but any comments there? I, I, absolutely, I think people will be lining up to um, file that lawsuit. So yeah, I would certainly expect litigation. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, I think with that, we'll move on to our current sign-on letter opportunity before we come back for a Q&A portion. So everyone think about some more questions that you might want to pose. Great, so I think I have shared this sign-on letter opportunity with most of the folks on the call, um, but as a refresher, um, this is a sign-on letter series is organizing given the state's shift in political dynamics and the many new legislators that have come into office as a, a means to educate new legislators and demonstrate to all policymakers the business community's ongoing support for existing and new climate, clean energy, and clean transportation policy. The letter specifically calls out Reggie, the Virginia Clean Economy Act, clean car standards, and the new medium and heavy duty ZEV MOU that Virginia joined recently as instrumental policies for achieving Virginia's climate goals and a resilient, prosperous economy. It's a pretty general letter, um, just vocalizing the ongoing support of the business community, not you know, addressing any specific current policy proposals. And we aim to deliver this to the General Assembly probably next week, um, which would be the second week of the legislative session. It's getting started this Wednesday. Uh, and, but if, if any of the folks on the call need a little bit more time, you may be able to extend the deadline a little bit. So please reach out to me with any questions. And a big thank you to Nestle, Hannah Armstrong, Unilever, and Worthen Industries who have already signed on. Before we move into q and I'm just gonna briefly touch on some examples of business advocacy in Virginia in recent years, which have garnered a lot of media attention and have been successful at demonstrating the economic case for clean energy and clean transportation investments, in addition to acting on the climate imperative. Here on this slide, we have a few examples of company sign-on letters that resulted in the successful adoption of clean car standards, strengthening the Virginia Clean Economy Act, and a strong show of support for participating in REGI uh, back in 2020. Thanks to all of you uh, who participated in these efforts. And with that, we will move on to the Q&A. I have one question here. Uh, it sounds like a lot of issues are going to play out in front of the state corporate commission. What might company engagement look like there? And anyone that wants to take that. Any or Matt, you wanna? Well, um, I guess I'll start. So. Um, the State Corporation Commission is an independent body, um, as you all likely know, um, that it has oversight by three judges um, in Virginia, one of which is up for re-election by the General Assembly this year. So that's maybe another dynamic to mention that um, that um, discussion will be playing out. Um, the legislature needs to approve um, um, either her reappointment or appointment of another judge. Um, you know, there are more limited opportunities for engagement, frankly, at the SEC than um, with the, uh, the legislature. Um, they are not, it's not an elected body, so they don't have the same sort of level of responsiveness. However, um, oftentimes legislators or, um, you know, outside parties will um, convey uh, opinions to the SEC through letters or, or comment. There's um, public comment periods as well. So um, could be opportunities for us to call upon um, businesses to engage on those matters. And the timeline for that, the SEC, you know, had, holds hearings, considers dockets all year long. Is that correct? Yes. OK, 
Okay, another question. Um, generally, what messages can the business voice be uh, the best carrier for, or what would resonate most with the new administration? You know, I, I think just from some of the comments that I highlighted earlier about Governor uh, elect Yonkin and his business background, I mean, he's a, he's a peer, you know, sort of to a lot of these folks in, in terms of their corporate strategies. And it should be a very small leap for him to really understand, um, you know, a lot of the demand on their side from whether it's from their board of directors or their customers and understanding that they're going to go to states. And this is a message that we've talked about for years, uh, but they're going to go to states and um, who have access to clean and renewable energy. And so just, you know, from that perspective, helping him understand not only the governor elect, but the, the House of Delegates as well, that this isn't just, you know, um, center left environmental policy. This is, um, this is being driven by, you know, consumers and businesses who really want access to cleaner energy in terms of deciding how the, they power their homes and businesses. And so um, finding ways to do that in the most cost effective manner as possible uh, is certainly going to speak uh, to them. But, you know, I, I think just understanding um, the, the demand and the wants and needs of the businesses and individuals um, and understand that it's not, this is an environmental policy as much as it's, um, you know, business uh, as anything. So I, I think all of that is very important in helping them to understand um, and contemplate as they take up a lot of much more nuanced issues on these issues. But from, from a big picture perspective, I think that's important. Yeah, I agree. I think the letter that you have is 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 brilliant, and getting as many many companies to sign onto that is is critical. I think, and pre presenting that to the general assembly uh, is is super important. I'd love for you to have that at at the event that we have um, on the nineteenth. To the copies of the letter, we can we can put that out and distribute it because we're going to have a number of legislators at that event. Great, yeah, I think that timeline will work well. Mm -hmm. One more question here. Are there other specific policy proposals or, or bills that are already out there related to clean energy or clean transportation and that we think have a viable pathway this legislative session? So we're still monitoring. Um, not all of our legislation has dropped yet. Um, I think there's a couple hundred bills out there and we expect a couple thousand um, by the time the, the filing deadline mm -hmm. comes um, on the 21st of January. Um, so, but I think the short answer is yes, we definitely expect to see legislation, um, both tweaks and substantive changes to the BCEA. Um, and um, there's some chatter around electric vehicles. I know we, you know, that was sort of a component of the clean cars um, discussion last year, um, but I think we'll continue to evolve. Um, and yes, we expect to definitely see some pieces move this year. Great, well, we will uh, certainly keep you all posted as new legislation is released and any opportunities that come with that. Uh, I think that's all for questions. So I'm happy to give folks a little bit of time back in their day. Thank you so much to the speakers uh, for Ron and Andrew. We have their contact information up on the slide as well as mine. Um, for any of you who have questions, feel free to reach out directly. And also um, I can connect you directly with Matt and Jenny um, if you have any other questions for them. And um, thanks so much to everyone that joined and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all. Thanks. Yeah, bye-bye.